started. Hello, everyone. Um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Noor Halabi, who is an assistant professor of media and communication at the University of Leeds and incoming interdisciplinary fellow at the University of Aberdeen. She is the vice chair of the Race Network of the Media, Communication, and Cultural Studies Association and the secretary of ICA's Ethnicity and Race in Communication Division. Her interdisciplinary research examines the interactions between race, migration, and social movements in global media. She is author of Radical Hospitality, <laughs> American Policy, Media, and Immigration, as well as other publications that examine global media and communication, including Discourses in Action, The Spatial Politics of the Syrian Revolution, A Middle East Critique, If These Walls Could Speak, Borders and Walls as Communicative Devices in Interventions, Communication Research and Practice. She received her doctorate from the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, masters from the London School of Economics, and bachelors from Pariquette Sorbonne. Uh, and our host for the evening is Dr. Liesel Hintz, who is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, Dr. Hintz received her PhD from George Washington University and held positions at Cornell University and Barnard College, Columbia University before coming to SAIS. Her research centers on contestation over various forms of identity, national, ethnic, religious, gender, et cetera. She analyzes identity contestation in the foreign policy arena in her first book and in the field of media and popular culture in her second book project. With a regional focus on Turkey and its neighborhood, her other work studies how identity politics shapes issues such as strategies of authoritarian consolidation, opposition mobilization, and security and defense decision making. Her work has been published in outlets including Security Studies, European Journal of International Relations, British Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, and Nationalities Papers, and she frequently contributes to foreign policy discussions in outlets including Foreign Policy, The Washington Post, CNN, and BBC World News. So two real juggernauts in front of you. Um, I am Dr. Sarah Parkinson. I'm faculty at Johns Hopkins University Political Science and SAIS, and I will be moderating the questions. So those of you online can submit questions through the chat. Those of you who are in the audience are Welcome to um, raise your hands and I will call on you after uh, Dr. Halabi's uh, presentation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Noor Halabi. Well, thank you for that. That was um, a very humble on your part <laughs> um, presentation. And I feel a little bit humbled by it. I didn't realize um, how much was in there. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's weird because I am in many ways very early in my academic career. So for those of you who want to transition into academia, it's a bit shocking when it gets to the point. <laughs> um, so with that, um, I just want to start us off with um, thanks for this invitation. It's really a huge honor to be speaking to um, two incredible scholars in conversation. I'm really itching to hear what engagement you have for me and perhaps what limitations and what critiques you may have as well. Um, I know my book isn't perfect, so I'm really, I'm welcoming that critique as well for future work. Um, and I'm really excited to speak to all of you, the new generation of thinkers, policymakers, um, movers and shakers that will be shaping the next era of immigration policy, policy in general, media, journalism, and all the fields that you enter. So I welcome you to think of ways in which this engagement with ethics and um, and morals of work would speak to what future careers you go into. So with that, um, launching into the topic of my, um, my book, um, so Radical Hospitality is a book that really tried to engage with this idea of the ethics of hospitality and the ways in which adopting an idea of hospitality as an ethical framework to conversations on uh, immigration and race could perhaps radically um, revolutionize how we have these conversations. And here's an example of one of the early texts that I saw in my research that defines 
some of the issues that I saw in the normalized conversation we have on race and immigration um, in the United States and beyond. Um, I will say also that I am a Syrian scholar who was a PhD student in the US at the time and the Muslim travel ban shaped how I was able to conduct research. So this was supposed to be a comparative pro project that looked at four countries and I could no longer travel as a researcher and so it shifted to the United States. And actually what happened is as that was taking place, I had a, it, an epiphany and a realization that although the United States talks about itself as a nation of immigrants, what conversations we have every day actually belie that um, narrative and show a much more contested, much more white supremacist conversation on immigration and race um, than perhaps the sort of myths that surround the country um, uh, portray. So here we see a, um, a question that was asked by Chris Wallace. Now, Chris Wallace is a, um, a leading journalist within me the media field. And this is important because oftentimes these le leading journalists um, steer the conversation that takes place within the entire media industry by framing things a certain way. And he was asking to the, during the presidential debates, the two candidates at the time, um, why should voters trust you rather than your opponent to deal with the race issues facing this country over the next four years. Now, one of the things I try to push back on in the book is the fact that oftentimes conversations on race frame the problem as race rather than racism. So why should voters trust you to deal with race rather than why should voters trust you to deal with racism, which is the real problem? And in doing so, what happens is it shifts the moral responsibility for the problem that we really face away from the people who practice racism to the people who are actually victims and often with deadly consequences of racism. Um, what also happens through doing so is that the figure of the racialized person becomes the place in which the problem of racism resides. Through their entire existence within a space, now we have a problem of racism. And this is sort of wrapped into the conversations that we have on immigration. I'll clarify a little bit further later. It speaks to a question that Du Bois had asked years before, um, about a century before, how does it feel to be a problem? And he was reflecting on this idea that oftentimes when people interact with him as a black man, they dance around the idea that his entire existence um, and appearance as a black man in spaces through the, the, the figure of his racialized person, his body begins to um, personify, to embody the problem um, that is race in society. So he becomes the figure that has to hold that, um, that pressure as opposed to anything um, that displaces that moral responsibility towards a person who practices racism. This also connects to conversations on immigration. Um, the question that Du Bois asked in 1903 connects with a question that Derrida asked in 1999. And here, this is a question that he initially, as those of you who you know have now ventured to work and study abroad can understand the idea that sometimes jokes and expressions don't translate perfectly. This here is a sentence that initially was written in French and plays on this idea that within French, the word l'étranger personifies not just the foreigner as a person, but all that is foreign, all that is unacceptable, all that is sort of objectionable as well, and all that comes from abroad. So here Derrida asks, isn't the question of the foreigner or the stranger a question of the stranger coming from abroad? And here again, coming from abroad is a play on words. It doesn't just come from abroad, but it comes from that person. So similarly, what has happened is the, the figure of the immigrant, the racialized body of the immigrant person has become the site in which the issue of immigration, the problem of immigration resides. And there's a connection here between race and immigration and how the both are treated in the sense that, and I talk about that a lot more in the book, is that immigration only became a problematic issue within policy when the makeup of global flows of migration shifted from majority European immigrants to majority racialized immigrants coming from the global South. So we see this move away from 85% of immigrants being European origin, um, 
perhaps a more Anglo-Saxon origin, especially for the US, and a shift towards or countries of origin coming from the global south. And it's right at that moment that we see, oh, we need to control immigration. We see these immigration policies that are sort of exclusionary, that are protectionist, that are trying to sort of protect society from the incoming, essentially the vector through which um, diversity is being injected into the public is that through that immigration um, flow. And so what I try to do in the book is connect conversations on immigration and on anti-immigrant anti policy to longstanding issues around white supremacy in the United States from the origin to the, of the country to today. And what I try to do as well is illustrate that we can't fix an issue zooming into it now and having a conversation about immigrants in the present moment without fixing the fact that throughout time, the American relationship with hospitality has been what I call poisoned. It has been colored by a white supremacist logic that um, polices identity and belonging to the United States and curates it to sort of white Anglo-Saxon um, uh, early immigrants, early settler immigrants. Um, the normalization that I talk about of the figure of the migrant becoming the problem has become so pervasive that it has begin, begun to be adopted by immigrants themselves, by would-be immigrants themselves. So here, this is an example of a, an article in Lebanon that is actually um, directed towards Lebanese audiences, telling them, don't think that by arriving in Europe that your problems are solved. Once you get to Europe, you, will, you are likely to become a forever problem. And this here is a Lebanese journalist speaking to a Lebanese public, internalizing this language of that immigrant is going to be a forever problem. I am a forever pro problem. Me, the person from the global south traveling to um, the United States. And that is some of the sort of tendency that I push against in the book is this idea of we have normalized this conversation of the problem of race, the problem of immigration, and we could radically reshift our conversation on these topics by adopting a frame of hospitality. Um, and here's, here's a little bit of what I mean by that. So interestingly, what I found when I was trying to do the theory chapter of this book is that it's, it's very interesting, the idea of hospitality, the ethic of hospitality, is universally accepted. Whatever language you look at, whatever religious context you look at, um, cultural, nationalist sort of um, narrative, oftentimes the conversation on hospitality, um, we see that hospitality occupies a universally positive position. In many ways, it mirrors the conversation on race. So just as hospitality occupies this universally positive position, racism occupies this universally negative position. Oftentimes, people are more insulted by being called racist than by doing something racist because it's so undesirable to be racist. So one of the things that I deal with is, is this slippage between what happens when we don't practice hospitality, but we venerate hospitality as an ethic. Um, and similarly, we practice racism, we abhor racism, but we're still doing it. And it's because we haven't framed these conversations within the correct framework. Um, so I argue that framing issues of immigration within a hospitality framework, sorry to rain, um, shifts moral responsibility away from the figure of the racialized person who is experiencing anti-immigrant sentiment to the moral responsibility of host societies and the moral responsibility of the population that currently resides in host societies to welcome incoming what Canadians call newcomers. So different countries will have different words for it. You, you're familiar with mm -hmm. it as someone who studies um, refugees um, and reframes it as well in terms of ideas of power. So here, who holds moral responsibility in this relationship when a refugee comes should reside with a sort of the relatively more powerful um, position of the native population. Um, every sort of culture I looked at, every religion, we see um, hospitality emerging as an indicator of the relationship to the divine, as an indicator of 
um, sort of the correctness of the cultural framework from Karam al-Arab to French hospitality. We continuously see this framework of hospitality coming out. Um, so I also thought it was a conceptual framework that speaks to many audiences, that translates east to west, north to south, um, in ways that perhaps could be useful in our conversations on migration flows. Um, how do I define hospitality when I look at it? I argue that hospitality is a relationship between a host that has developed an identity that is spatially anchored in place. And in previous research, I look at this idea of Syrian identity so spatially anchored. Uh, Damascus is a walled city, very much like Bologna. So my past work looks at this idea of the walls structuring identity. Um, so an identity that's spatially anchored to a place and thus seen to be belonging to it and possessing authority over it. And a guest who enters the host domain and whose identity is perceived as tied to other places. I argue that if we frame conversations on immigration within a framework of hospitality and also within a um, historical framework that contextualizes it within the broader history of a nation and not the presentist history of what is taking place right now, we are able through hospitality to see aberrations in the patterns in which immigration, migration and movement have been treated. Framing migration as a dyadic relationship between host and guest allows us to more clearly see abuses of hospitality, abuses of fundamental ideas of human rights, um, as a result. Here's an example to just make that clear. If we were to take the relationship of settler colonialism, which is one of the very first instances of immigration hospitality in the United States, we see here a relationship between a host, here the native population, the indigenous peoples um, and tribes of um, the, the continent, and a guest who is a settler colonial at the time European migrant coming in. And what we start to see very early on, and I detail that a lot more in the book, is a brutal genocidal shift and abuse of hospitality here, wherein the guest assumes the position of host and holds the original host hostage. So the Native American population becomes hostage in the sense that they lose their freedoms, they lose their mobilities, they lose their relationship to the land. And remember that idea of host was very tied to belonging and authority over place. Um, they lose their epistemological sort of um, perception of the relationship between person and land. Um, and here we see the first instance of what I call the poison beginning of American hospitality where settler colonialism shifted that first host guest relationship into a deformed host hostage relationship in which the settler colonial adopted the host position. Similarly, and this poisoned position of early hospitality history in the United States lay the framework for this idea that hospitality is racially um, sort of ring fenced and extended to white immigrants only in the sense that we see the, the foundations for the brutality of slavery laid down first with the aberration that we saw with the treatment of Native American people. And so what we see the second time around, um, not long after, is this second poisoned beginning of American hospitality, wherein a host, now assumed host, the settler colonial um, population has now assumed the host position, brings in not a guest, but a hostage against their will, kidnapped from their countries of origin. And in their position in the United States, these are people, and I detail that brutally and honestly in the book, get separated. Um, and there's a second genocide that takes place in terms of languages, religions, family structure, traditions, all these different things that take place that very clearly situate the position of um, of the sort of first board forced migrants in the United States um, as hostages within that relationship. And throughout the book, what I try to do is I set that in the introduction and I say that we cannot fix how we treat immigration in later periods without fixing that poison beginning that is the foundation of the country. And we can't have a conversation. So I, I noticed, for example, that I did this research in Canada 
where Syrian refugees, when they were coming in, first were called newcomers because everyone's a settler unless you're indigenous. And they were being welcomed by, um, oops, they were being welcomed by uh, First Nations peoples as their first welcome into the nation because there was an understanding that the First Nation people hold the right authority over that land and they were the only people that could welcome you, that could extend hospitality to you. And oftentimes conversations with Syrian refugees there, ref they reflected on this idea of how welcome they felt because this unsettled this assumption that a Canadian person, that belonging to Canadian identity was reserved to being white uh, European sort of settler immigrant. Um, so this was kind of the beginning of it. That is not to say that hospitality is perfect. I am very, I'm the first to critique my own work. I'm not perfect. I made my contribution to this conversation. I myself am a Syrian immigrant. Um, so I saw this as my sort of contribution to my adopted country. Um, but it's not perfect in the sense that hospitality itself is still a relationship of alterity. It's a relationship where there's an, I call it an imbalanced relationship of spatially anchored power. Like even I acknowledge that by saying hospitality is a framework, I acknowledge that the host population here holds power. And what I argue in the book is although it is not a perfect framework, it has its limitations, it's still a useful framework to understanding and perhaps more justly treating immigration. Um, that's not to say again, that it's not with it without its own issues, but it's also an inescapable, um, inescapable dynamic in many ways, in the sense that throughout my research in earlier work, I have found that it's, it's impossible to reside in a place for long without feeling a sense of ownership and belonging and authority over that place. It's really what I ended up working on in previous research is this idea, idea that we are very intricately tied in terms of identity to the places we have resided, to the places we have resided for, and the longer it is, the longer that authority is. Um, and so it's inescapable in terms of how human beings engage with place, how they build meaning with place, that you then, if you reside in a place long enough, you feel the sense of it's my place. And even think of it, um, I, I give this uh, lecture to students on my walls paper where I talk to them about just being part of a university. Over time, you spend time in it, it's my place. I, you know, when you invite a student from another university, you know, you know the layout of your, in many ways, you are extending hospitality to that student who's visiting from another school. Um, so oftentimes in the book, I reckon with this issue of, it's imperfect as a framework. It raises other ethical issues, um, but it is my honest contribution to that debate. Um, and it navigates this tendency within human interaction where we inevitably tie identity, we inevitably feel the sense of intense ownership um, to place. Um, so um, moving on from that, um, how do I then? beyond defining hospitality, beyond thinking about why it would be useful in terms of changing our thinking, um, how do I apply it? So um, my background is in um, communication studies and political science. So I navigate those two fields almost equally at this point. So I'm moving from a media school to a political science school at the moment. Um, and so this book really tries to marry that idea of how do we look at um, media hospitality, so how media coverage treats the issue of migration and the figure of the immigrant. And I look at both. Remember, I'm also interested in that, the figure of the racialized immigrant becoming the site of the problem. Um, and how we look, we can look at policy and how policy treats the figure of the immigrant. And together, I argue that these two components um, are manifestations of, in modern society, how we see hospitality extended or denied. Um, and they have a very big impact on home building. So Hassan Hajj has a, a really interesting paper on that topic that still relates to food. So you might find it really interesting. I'm sure you're citing it in your work. Um, but this idea that it's also all these manifestations of hospitality 
have a huge impact on how immigrants navigate um, their belonging and their identity and home building. Um, after I kind of developed this idea of the theoretical framework and why hospitality, I then looked at three different periods of American history. The first of which was the 1880s. Um, those of you who are familiar with immigration policy in the United States, this was a period where the Chinese Exclusion Act was was passed, and this was um, this was a this was an act that basically not limited entire completely sort of stopped immigration coming in from China. Um, and in fact, in the book, I also talk about immigration from Hong Kong, although legally was British, was also limited because again, what I talk about in the book is this idea that the hospitality is racially um, that ring fenced and not, it really doesn't have to do with legally what country you belong to. So it was a British citizen who's Chinese, then you get lumped in with the Chinese Exclusion Act because the real exclusion is towards race um, as the indicator. Um, and interestingly, and again, um, this is part of this bigger argument I make about history as a restorative um, practice within every field. Um, so I saw these connections as I'm working um, between the medicalized nativism of the 1800s and the post-COVID-19 conversation that was taking place that attributed to um, Chinese immigrants these ideas of disease, that they're bringing in disease, that they're unhygienic, et cetera, et cetera, that they're culinary practices, that they're, um, that they're living uh, conditions, all reinforce this idea of lack of hygiene and disease. Now, these are not my ideas. I do not agree with these ideas, but these were all ideas that came out in the newspaper coverage and policy coverage that I was seeing in that period. Um, so Chinese immigrants were labeled um, during that time. And funny enough, again, history tends to rhyme. We, I saw the exact same dynamic that we saw with the conversation on wet markets, on uh, lack of hygiene, and on limiting immigration during COVID-19. Um, it also began an overarching pattern of resistance of home building, of immigrant advocacy that continued in every other period that you look at in the United States. So um, oftentimes we don't look at the fact that um, desegregation policies, that lifting limits on naturalization policies, all of that is actually um, groundwork that was laid from one, so from one racialized group to another. And, therein lies the beauty of intersectionality is that we're able to kind of draw our strength. Um, and so the news articles of the time tended to sort of highlight this idea of foreignness, this uh, um, demonizing uh, Chinese immigrants. I'm, I do not put the image in this talk and we had this conversation before. Um, I put the least offensive image up here. Um, there in the book I have the more offensive ones, and I talk about how we really need to visibly see that violence in order to sort of grasp um, the level of dehumanization that is taking place and in order to correct these trends um, in immigration conversations in later periods. The second period I look at is the 1920s. And the 1920s is interesting because it bucks against a presentist trend to see whiteness as uniform. Um, a, a sort of de facto established fact in um, current politics today, because in the 1920s, um, a lot of different groups were what's called entering whiteness. They were not actually accepted as white. Um, this includes, uh, includes Poles, the Greek, Irish, Germans, Italians, Russians, et cetera. All these non-Anglo-Saxon groups of immigrants were actually at the point in the middle of their cultural transition into um, into whiteness. Um, and what we'll see as well in the book is that they actually coalesce around anti-immigrant sentiment towards even more non-white in order to in order to consolidate this solidarity among different white groups. Um, what we also saw during that period is an intensification. So this is the period of um, the first plague that got cited quite a lot in conversations on COVID-19. So this is the period of um, uh, the Spanish flu, 
1918. So there's an intensification of medicalized nativism during this period as plagues grip Europe and the United States. Um, and there is a trend of connecting immigrants to all social ills, disease, inebriation, um, the idea of inferior genes, mongrelization of America, again, not my word, word that appears in the media coverage, as well as ideas of disloyalty and anarchism. And we're going to see that rhyme again in the next period. Um, and oftentimes I talk about this a lot with students, is that I find it really ironic that you'll see um, immigrants to a different country. One of the first things they want to do in the United States is attend 1920s parties and balls. It's very interesting because you get these like really sort of diverse groups of immigrants who really want to attend something that looks like Gatsby's big gala. Mm -hmm. And they never deal with the fact that there is a huge layer of racism that is wrapped into that moment. Um, this exclusion, exclusionary sentiment that engulfed everyone who wasn't white in that moment. And this is really the period where we see eugenicist logic come out in the United States. We see um, sort of white supremacist arguments around immigration. Um, and oftentimes conversations around prohibition don't deal with the fact that the prohibition movement was actually primarily an anti-immigrant movement. We talk about that a lot more in the book. It was sort of directed towards Italians and Germans because the Italians produced wine, the Germans produced beer, and that was their big livelihood. And one of the ways you could attack that livelihood is with a prohibition movement that labeled these new immigrants as, at the time new, new immigrants as, um, as more likely to be inebriated, as more likely to be drunks, and hence using that. Again, not my words. This is all the stuff that really comes out. In, and, and yeah, we've we've had these conversations about how do you navigate that conversation. Um, another thing that isn't dealt with quite a lot when we deal with the 1920s is that the origin of a lot of eugenic pseudoscience actually begins in the United States. And I talk in my book about the number of universities and colleges across America that had textbooks and courses and programs teaching eugenicist science at the time and the fact that actually the inspirations for what we ended up seeing in Europe, a lot of it drew from books that were written, written in the United States and then imported into, um, into uh, Europe, and some of which were cited by Hitler as important texts, foundational texts in his own thinking. And that's really important to grapple with is there is a history there. You know, this didn't come from abroad. It didn't come from Europe to the United States. Actually, the United States has a role to play in that conversation. Um, uh, Julia Rose Kraut also talks about this idea that during this period, we see the, the first coherent beginning of the national security threat framework of immigration treatment. So during this time, we see this treatment of immigrants as um, suspect. Um, basically, they must harbor um, uh, anarchist um, ideologies, they must harbor sort of um, uh, leftist undesirable ideologies at the time. There was there was a red scare through which a lot of sort of Russian immigrants get, ended up rounded up and imprisoned for no reason. And we see this is the beginning of what we see later, this idea of the immigrant as a national security threat that we saw post 9-11, which brings me to um, the next period. So following from the 1920s, and this is really the the last big period that I look at, um, during 9-11, and this is another history as a paradigm shifting radical um, framework, for, for those of you, you know, you're a generation younger compared to me, the sort of ways in which 9-11 foundationally restructured the conversation on immigration are taken as fact. They're kind of like that conversation about how would you deal the, with the problem on race? But actually, historically, um, immigration was not treated as a national security question. It was only post 9-11 that we see the creation of the Department for Homeland Security and the sort of um, uh, hoovering up of a multiple different organizations, um, the Immigration Naturalization Service, 
uh, Customs and Border Protection, all the, including FEMA, which is interesting as well in terms of who has access to FEMA if you're not a citizen. All of that gets hoovered up, about 19 agencies get put into the Department of Homeland Security. And this begins this moment of very clearly delineating immigration is now a national security question and immigrants are now a national security threat. And it sort of encompasses indiscriminately everyone who gets put in. We see NSEERS, which is that registry of incoming immigrants who come from Muslim majority countries. And there's, there's a lot more in the book, but it's that moment where we really crystallize these trends that have been brewing in earlier periods, the 1920s especially, of this idea that these immigrants are gonna come with these foreign political ideologies that not, you know, do not, are not welcome in the body politic and enrich our thinking and political thought. Instead, they are suspect, they're undesirable, and hence they, need, they necessitate a different treatment of the immigrants. So these earlier periods of associating immigrants with undesirable political affinities lay the groundwork for what happens in 9-11 and the categorization of Muslims specifically as these undesirable incoming immigrants who are both hard enemies, i.e. undefeatable enemies, sort of um, difficult enemies to tackle, but also ones that target soft targets. So there was all this media coverage during the time that um, Muslim terrorists are gonna target kindergartens, schools, all of which of course was at the time not, not sort of supported by any evidence, but in this kind of bigger um, boogeyman construction of the Muslim person as an undefeatable enemy, but also one that is especially brutal in attacking women and children. And this brings me to the last, um, my last sort of element of my argument, which really was happening as I was wrapping up the book, um, was we were beginning to grapple with what happened with Muslim travel ban and how did, you know, I went from at the beginning of the book reframing my project entirely because I could no longer do my four country analysis, so I could no longer travel, to at the end thinking, actually the Muslim travel ban was a moment of, um, similar to 9-11, was a moment of intense, shifting in the conversation. What do I mean by that? I had these interviews with Muslim immigrants in the United States and even Muslim Americans. And they would tell me our biggest shock and a huge emotional moment for us was witnessing Americans line up at airports and ports of entry with big signs and chants saying, let them in. Very interesting moment. Now, if you're a Muslim who has never ever navigated an airport, or a port of entry in the United States, including myself, it is a very precarious moment where you're very much made to feel like no one wants to let you in. The fact that there were crowds of people chanting outside of airports, let them in, was a, was a huge paradigm shift in our conversation on immigration. We see what happens with the Muslim travel ban as this public mobilization to begin to understand the figure of the immigrant. Here it was a Muslim immigrant, but really it could have been any category. Um, really beginning to understand the humanity of the immigrant, beginning to see them as an actual victim of policy, rather than as a public seeing the government as some sort of protector of the public from the specter of the threat of this incoming immigrant, which we see in 1920s and we see in 1880s and we see um, in earlier periods of history post 9-11. So in many ways, ironically, the restrictiveness, the hostility, the lack of hospitality of the policy signaled a shift or, or, or sort of encouraged a shift towards radical hospitality by the public. And I actually argue hospitality can't necessarily sort of be orchestrated from the top down it really comes from a shift within national thinking of the public. The real host here is not necessarily a government deciding, but the people actually sensing the humanity of the coming uh, person coming in and letting them in. Um, this also mirrors some of the big conversations that are taking place in terms of public opinion and immigration. So just as this is taking place, we really are starting to see this increasing share of the public that actually thinks immigration is desirable, actually thinks that you know, immigrants should be let in, that there should be an increase of legalized pathways towards 
coming to the United States or other countries. Um, and you'll notice quite a lot of the receiving countries up top um, do see Im immigration as a way to make their country stronger, um, as a way to diversify the types of skills, the types of the richness of the cultural patchwork that is um, within the country itself. So this might be a little bit small, but these are peer research center studies that actually begin to track how public opinion is shifting, not only in the United States, but around the world regarding immigration. And it's really important because unfortunately with climate change, with the sort of shift that we're seeing globally, immigration isn't going to stop and it's actually gonna accelerate quite significantly. Um, so after publishing this book, we saw Pakistan, um, and the floods that happened in Pakistan, we're seeing there's going to be layers and layers of um, not just political forced migration, but also climate change related forced migration. And, and it's really important to have these conversations now, critically, before we begin to have these, you know, layers upon layers of different push factors that push people to um, to take that journey of forced migration um, to the United States, but also to all, all the sort of potential host countries that could be hosting immigrants. And with that, I will wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation, really packed with um, empirical detail that I think is really important for us to understand. I really like the historical context um, that your book is built on um, and the ways in which, as you say, history rhymes. You know, you see the the groundwork being laid for um, for uh, the ways in which these conversations are vilifying uh, immigrants um, very early on, um, and that the fact that this um, uh, kind of discussion about medicalized racism, I think, is really fascinating. This otherization of uh, the immigrants as as uh, unclean, unhygienic, dangerous, bringing threats, bringing disease and so forth. Um, you know, and you you have this great discussion in there um, about how uh, the con living conditions of, say, the Chinese immigrants um, are being criticized and saying, oh, look, they're all living in in so many you know the the quarters are so small and and they're they're sort of packed in there but that the reason for that is because of safety and numbers and that they were being they were targets of violence and so that they lived in these larger communities in order to protect themselves um so i i just really i want to be very brief in in my comments um because i want to leave time for questions but i want to um really say that the media and politics initiative has wanted to host you for a long time so we're very very glad to do that um, and I think it's incredibly important for us to unpack how foundational the media is, not just in reporting news, but in constructing understandings of who we are and who is the us and who is the them and what are the politics behind that. And I love how your book does that. I think it, it you know, it analyzes the regulatory framework. So like what are the legal policies towards particular identity groups? But really looking, you know, through really painful images to to watch or painful images to view um, and painful quotes to read, understanding how those symbols and that language constructed this other. I really appreciate the concept of hospitality um, in the sense that it is about degrees of openness and that that can vary and that that can mean that particular groups are treated differently than others. So I really like the flexibility that you built in and this sort of tension. So it is a positive concept, right? And, and as you kind of point out in this cultural context and religious context, we think about providing hospitality as a positive thing, but it's also an inherently otherizing one. You're never the host yourself, right? You, you know how like you're, you're at your friend's house and even if it's one of your best friends, you still are constantly reminded it's not your place. Like there's this hospitality that is good for the us in the sense that here we are, this benevolent group that is hosting the them, but it's a constant reminder that you're still a them. So I really appreciate the tensions that, that I think that that concept brings in. Um, she does have these three um, historical cases, which I think are really, really useful in looking at how this construction is, is building um, uh, over time. So I just want to, again, kind of commend the use of the, the hospitality concept um, and sort of these, these strategies of vilification and thinking about how important language is and how careful we should be 
one of the things that I really appreciate about your work is that, and I mentioned this earlier, is that it's not just analysis. This is a normative intervention. This is a call to think differently about the language that we use. And I think that's incredibly important. You not only analyze the ways in which visual and, and sort of symbolic and, and written uh, vilifying language constructs the the other, but you're sort of calling for a rethinking of that. And so I, I appreciate that quite a bit. And and sort of thinking about the, as comes through in the book, the dehumanizing language that we use when we talk about immigrants. And, you know, whether it's New York Times or or any of these mainstream print publications, think about how many times you see like, you know, a flood of refugees, right? Or a horde or a swarm. Like these are dehumanizing animalistic terms that are being used to kind of construct this, this threat. So I think really making us be accountable for the language we use is, is really important here. Um, I just want to ask a uh, kind of probe a question that that we, we had discussed previously and that, that um, you had brought up in kind of thinking about you as the scholar in trafficking in these really painful um, subjects and, and your positionality as a Syrian scholar. Um, how do you sort of decide what to include? How do you decide um, what's the ethics of the data that you're presenting in terms of kind of the sensitivity of some of these subjects? Can you talk just a little bit about kind of how you, you navigate that either just sort of as a scholar in general or sort of your own positionality as well? Some of the tensions that perhaps all of you in your research and in your practice moving forward are going to be tackling is there's often this conversation within literary theory as well, like what words do you include in a text? Um, and what I found with this book is that there were moments where I needed the reader to grasp the level of violence that was taking place. And if I were to obscure to edit away that violence, then we will not, will not, we won't fully grasp it, and we won't fix um, the issues that are built into that dynamic in the sense that we continue to see these narratives. So I'll give you an example. Um, there are some less tense examples, like, for example, the Chris Wallace one. When a journalist asks to candidates who are white, who are white men, um, how will you deal with the issue of race? Presumed within the construction of that question is that racialized people are not part of the public who are assessing this candidate. That the person being spoken to as the mainstream electorate, mainstream voter is the white voter. And the racialized person is not part of the sort of desired, what we call target audience in media studies, is not the real target audience that is being spoken to here. And that's important because again, it continues this narrative of racialized people being second or third uh, rate citizens within the United States. So these are way, these are moments where that violence is very sort of insidious. It's, it's not particularly visible. And I do this work of unpacking the violence that's taking place in that statement. But there are moments where there was very clear over like you said, like dehumanizing slurs. slurs. And, and I often have to, you know, when I present the book, talk about these aren't my opinions, but you need to know. Because, and the reason I say that is because the, I, I, the choice I made is when the narrative continues and repeats. So for example, there are these issues I see in the 1880s that repeat in the sense that we then see Donald Trump calling the COVID-19 uh, 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 disease the Kung flu. Right. So we then see, OK, that violence needs to be addressed, needs to be put out in the open because we need to deal with the fact that it's repeating. So these are usually the choices where I made, OK, this this needs to be in there. I don't know if I always did it right. Um, so oftentimes I, I have actually struggled, like when I went when I dealt with the Native American question, there was some real brutal stuff in there. Um, um, decapitating. Um, beating children against rocks. I mean, there's some really brutal material in there. Um, but I often had to ask, okay, what is the concept here that I'm trying to illustrate? So for example, genocide was really important to me. The dynamic of 
in hospitality, slipping into genocide was really important to me. And these are elements, these types of. So, yeah, it's a very hard question. And it's even hard as a researcher. You're sitting with an archive and the archive is telling you some grotesque, difficult, terrifying things that human beings have done to each other. And you're trying to write about hospitality. You're trying to write about seeing each other as human beings. Um, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Um, so oftentimes you're going to have to, you know, you're with Black Lives, Black Lives Matter happened during my book. Again, big part of how I navigated these ethical questions. You're going to deal with that in your own practice. When do you do you let the buck stand like stop with you and go, actually, I'm going to address this. And one of the ways I need to address it is to first deal with the violence, grapple with the violence, visibly show the violence. So um, Khadija White and others talk about the importance of videos of um, of uh, police brutality in terms of allowing us to first have a conversation. They weren't easy videos to watch. So again, it's a difficult question for, yeah. And I guess, you know, a lot of us deal with issues of, of genocide, of natural mm -hmm. disaster, you know, it's in your work as well. And how, how do you sort of deal with that question of what do I include? I think the the inclusion of it is skillful, and I think that the the fact that it moves us so much is is because you are kind of having us having to confront. I think the the experiences um, and the language that was used. So I I think it's it's very well done. But we appreciate sort of hearing what that process is like in terms of making those kind of ethical decisions. Um, so again, I don't want to take up time. I want to leave the questions uh, to the students. So do you want to moderate the discussion? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to open the floor to questions. And again, just thank you so much for opening such a rich conversation. And I'm looking forward to seeing how our student body responds to this. If you are joining us online, you can put questions in uh, the Q&A box, um, and then I will see them here and can call them. Um, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question because I did deal with that a lot. Um, because again, I was the first person who was aware of the limitations of even the framework I was using. And I was very, I was very humble in this sort of, here's my contribution. It isn't perfect, but it's, it's my sort of labor of love. I call it my labor of love to my new country. Um, Cause I myself was becoming uh, an American citizen as this book was being written. Um, and the way I reconcile this issue of um, hospitality is that a, the big sort of positive that com can come out of hospitality is that first moment of encounter, is how do we encounter the other when they arrive at our shores or at our airports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I also argue that hospitality, like you said, um, can't continue to be hospitality. And so it's only there to hold space long enough for you to home build and transition into becoming part of the host. Um, so um, in many ways that encountering, there's a very famous, um, there's a very famous short film, very old short film um, about um, different um, waves of immigration to Israel where every wave of immigration, once the boat comes back, comes in, um, is exclusionary towards the next wave of immigration. So part of it is if you, you encounter hospitality at one point, you're more likely. If you encounter hospitality in settings that are not settler colonial, you're also more likely to encounter the humanity of other humans. So again, I talk about that a lot more in my book about settler colonial nations and how they didn't sign different treaties regarding refugee rights, but also on 
very com yeah there's a lot there in the book um where i i deal with the particular situation of settler colonial countries and the ways in which they need to sort of disentangle and deconstruct early violence in order to deal with stuff um so going back to your question it's positive at the very beginning it's positive in the encounter and i talk about ways in which hospitality is practiced in terms of um, giving people shelter giving but also hospitality being like you said openness so that means treating the person coming in as someone you can learn from rather than saying this is someone who is an object of my pity and who is an object of my charity but actually the person who comes in brings with them a rich culture a language skills a, a, a complete richness that could add to our value and then the other thing I talk about more in the book is that restricting hospitality to the realm of um, of economical economic policy then restricts our ability to actually, as human beings, encounter each other. So when you talk about being open to learning from immigrants, when you talk about being being open to their all their languages that they bring in becoming part of that texture and fabric for fabric and richness of the nation if you simply encounter them as incoming sort of workforce who will work and have no other contribution then you lose that and actually what you're losing is something that adds richness and diversity and economic activity but also cultural activity like think of we talked about this uh, we talked about this earlier about the importance of the arts the importance of of culture, the importance, it adds richness to our lives in ways that simply having, you know, a conversation on economics and, and them coming in as workforce and contr contributing to taxes and the pension scheme, like, you know, Germany had a an early conversation on that sort of um, impoverishes the potential of immigration being that moment of human beings seeing each other. And I talk a lot more in the book about the fact that the way you treat the stranger who comes to your door is an affirmation for a society of what they see as the sort of value of a human being. So once you accept that violence being inflicted on an immigrant, whatever that immigrant may be, you've actually accepted that any human being may be treated that way. Um, for the native population, so I talk a lot more about the slippage of how extrajudicial treatment of people post 9-11 slipped into how native population got treated um, in later periods. So actually what you accept, and this is a concept from Hannah Arendt, who is a scholar who experienced uh, Nazi Germany and reflected on the sort of banality of violence that took place um, uh, during that period. So she talks about how the way you encounter that stranger is indicative of you as a society in terms of what your values are and what you see a human being worthy of in terms of treatment. Um, so that's the biggest value um, for a host society is that it makes a host society think about itself. What what do we see a human being is worthy of? Next question.
religion is is a very interesting topic because in in everyday conversation we often say you know you never talk about religion but when it comes to immigration hospitality religion was such a huge factor at one point during the um i forget the paper but there was a political science paper right as i was writing my book that actually showed people a picture of a refugee and told them the refugee was christian or muslim and they saw a massive shift in the degree of sort of recept receptiveness um and ironically what you're describing is something different because here there's an interest in non-christians in order to proselytize um, but in the book, I talk a lot about hospitality being very importantly, allowing the person to be themselves. So, and religion comes up a lot in the book. So unlike everyday conversation where you say don't talk about religion, it comes up so much in the media coverage, it comes up so much in the book, is this idea that a lot of immigration hostility in the early period of American history was about um, the words were they worship strange gods and speak strange tongues. So repeatedly this frame of um, these heathens, these sort of uh, people who worship strange gods that are foreign to us, and them being unacceptable for that reason. And hospitality that is conditioned on a person adopting your religion is not necessarily hospitality. It's this and and this is not an idea that I came up with, but this idea that conditional hospitality isn't actually hospitality. It's sort of this deformed form of something simulating hospitality, but not being really hospitality. So there's a tension there. So one, one dynamic that you may see is when the person is the wrong religion um, or that incentive of proselytizing isn't there, then the interest drops. And that that's attention because again that person is still a human being right so the framework of the book is trying to see people as human beings and acknowledge their humanity and extend them welcome because i see you as a human and every human in my eyes deserves um consideration right so once that human doesn't perform in a way that i would like that conditionality means that i've lost that value of i am simply welcoming you because you are a human and as a fellow human i believe that human beings deserve certain treatment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks for asking that though. It's a tricky question to ask. I... <laughs> yeah. Is this a two finger on that or yeah. directly related? And then I'll move. Hmm. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> mm. mm -hmm. So again, another difficult question because I'm very anti-assimilation in many ways. Um, in the sense that a lot of assimilation assumes that this person now needs to integrate and needs to essentially become. And, and again, very importantly, when we say you need to integrate or assimilate, what we are saying is the normative standard medium voter member of the public is X. And so now in order to assimilate, you need to become more like X, i.e. speak with less accent or over time, so all of these different very problematic adopt a religion, right? So eat pork, right? All of these, all of these identifications of Christian nationalist, white supremacist, all these different ways in which we may demarcate who our average person is, we're then saying by assimilating, you need to approximate one of the problems that happened with that is earlier conversations on assimilation what they encouraged is different waves of people trying to be the model minority trying to approximate whiteness to align themselves with whiteness and therefore sort of re um repeat but also exacerbate issues of um sort of white supremacy in the u.s and discrimination towards especially it's especially the sort of black community and african-american community so oftentimes you see these um, immigrant groups and that's why i talk about you can't deal with immigration without dealing with the poison beginnings because what you're doing is you're encouraging immigrants to come in and be very racist towards black people in order to then assimilate into whiteness and align themselves with whiteness and that's deeply problematic um so i don't think i adopt much assimilation rhetoric i don't agree with it yeah 
it's not hospitality to me like saying you need to come to my house and I talk like I make it very easy in the sense that hospitality begins in the home and some of the first ways we encounter it are in our home if you come into my house and I go yeah you are only welcome in your in my house if you start to do everything like me and become like me then that's not really that's not hospitality that's again a hostage situation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I often say that I learn more from students oftentimes than I teach them. So I gave this talk about, the. it was just a chapter of the book in, in Qatar, in Northwestern Qatar. And one of the students went, you know, brown people have their own brown people. And that's really what she did. <laughs> she was trying to sort of illustrate the issues. Mm -hmm. um, now, the book was supposed to be four countries one of which was in the Gulf. But then I was Syrian. And when the Muslim ban happened, essentially, I can't leave the country and be able to come back in. So I couldn't conduct the other field work. That said, the aspiration was to grapple with this happens not just in settler colonial countries. It doesn't just happen in countries where that white supremacy is practiced by sort of Caucasian white people. White supremacy is an ideology that we can all flip into knowingly or unknowingly. And one of the reasons that we do is to um, to align ourselves with power. Um, so it could be an issue of colorism. It could be, you know, Turkey, there's all this conversation about not being Arab, being European. There's all these sort of alignment with white supremacy that may take place. Um, so yeah, I do grapple with that in some ways not unfortunately not in this project because of the way things were like unfolded um but i do in terms of the different chapters and how different so um there's a chapter where i talk about this article that when i saw it i just it took me a couple of days of emotionally dealing with it it was an article that announced that a white man was lynched and the article was actually about a syrian man who was lynched and I grapple with the idea that um, Syrians at the time, uh, historical Syrians, so at the time, Lebanon was also part of Syria. He was actually a Lebanese person, but Syrians had argued in court that they were white in order to be able to naturalize. Um, they picked someone who looked very light-skinned, argued in court. That's why, for example, in the census, all these Middle Easterners are classified as white. So interestingly, that article raised an issue of if this man was white, why was he lynched? Because the exact term of lynching in the media narrative at the time was reserved for being black and very sort of, it was very clearly reserved for being black. And if he was lynched, then he was not white. And what I was trying to argue here is in, the, the, in his death, essentially the way he was framed shows you that when minorities show up and get sold this false idea that aligning themselves with whiteness will save them, all they are doing is perpetuating white supremacy that will still kill them um, and, and not solving the root core of the problem. Um, it's why, for example, I'm really happy that there's an advocacy at the moment for 
Middle Easterners to be recognized in the census because I yeah. think, yeah, it's it's starting to allow people to see themselves um, as look in the past we may have aligned ourselves with whiteness for this specific reason but it it has not helped to deal with the core issue being white supremacy oh i'm right. blind i'm gonna try i'm gonna try to see the next try to see the next question yes I'm listening. Excellent point. Excellent point. Let's, I mean, going back to the example I was giving you earlier, sometimes egregious moments are moments of reflection. Yes, I do think like Obama had policies that Donald Trump was repeating, but somehow because we now perceive Donald Trump in a different way, there was a different conversation by the American progressive movement towards these policies. Um, and Sears was no different from what was what Trump was proposing in terms of sort of a list of a registry of Muslims in the uh, US. That said, so in the different periods I looked at, oftentimes even the most extreme policy, Chinese exclusion was really extreme. Um, even the extreme policies, what happened was when I looked at them, you see Chinese exclusion passed with broad agreement by both political parties. And broad acceptance by the public, no matter political affiliation. 9-11, um, same, everyone rallied around the flag and there was this agreement, no matter you know if it's a Republican or Democrat pre president, people still lined up behind these policies. There was very little pushback. The travel ban was interesting in the sense that for the first time, it was a moment in which an extreme policy was being enacted in American history and the public was not agreeing. So yes, they would have accepted something less um, in the sense that it would have kind of flown under the radar and Sears flew under the radar. Um, but at the same time, it was unique in the sense that the public chose to not align themselves, whereas travel ban they did, national quotas they did. Um, generally, there was an acceptance of these policies in the past that didn't happen with travel ban. Um, but yet I think we had this conversation earlier. Sometimes you can have policies that are extreme, that are so poorly calculated that they achieve the, the, like the opposite outcome. Mm -hmm. And that was very much the case with Trump when it came to that policy. He could have framed it differently and in, intelligently. And as a result, had the exact same policies because Obama was basically doing the same thing. Um, so NSEERS, like a registry of people coming in. Um, I Every single time I came into the country, I would have to like have these um, interviews and records of my entry and exit as a Syrian that all existed under Obama. It wasn't it wasn't Trump. Um, so, yeah, I think framing was really important there. Yeah, it's it's. It's interesting because it you're both completely correct in the sense that they would have accepted something less, but at the same time, it is shocking that for the first time an extreme policy did not have, not even in terms of sort of public opinion, it didn't it didn't even have a sort of half half support. It was really like, and and we saw with the electoral college and all that that it's really not a majority situation. Um, as well. So although you, the Republican Party might might have been supportive of it, not um, not the sort of broader public if you were to, to do public opinion polling. Um, yeah, 
tricky tricky yes they would have accepted something less and they did repeatedly from obama i would also just i think that's a fantastic response and and i think the question is an important one i would also say that i think in, especially in a time of populism and with populist leaders it's not really the policy that's the point it's like the extremism is the point mm -hmm. yeah. in a sense yeah. like the identity politics of it um, I think is, you know, well, maybe we we want these policies for national security reasons, but no, it's not really that. It's mm -hmm. more about the otherizing that that is able to to kind of create that us versus them that we see in in identity politics and populism. And I think the timing is crucial too, because there were so many people, I think, at that point um who and you write about this in the book, who were so kind of horrified at Trump's election that they, they found something to rally around um, because it happened so quickly into his presidency. So I think the timing there is important too. I actually want to jump in here very selfishly. So this is me taking moderator privilege. Um, may you learn how to use it well and mostly <laughs> responsibly. Um, but I wonder if part of what was going on there, or I would love to hear your thoughts on um, how you think ideas about deservingness played into how people responded to the Muslim ban versus um, the tightening and now not reopening of numbers of refugees who are admitted into the country. So we talked about my disasters class today, many of them in the room, talked about hierarchies of victimhood and how ideas of deservingness come to play and what and maybe how people interact with their own conceptions of hospitality. So I would love to hear from you a little, even a little more about this and what role deservingness specifically might play mm -hmm. or even the idea of, well, they're deserving people who might be suffering, but that deservingness is based on very racially structured categories and ideas of massification. Mm -hmm. oh, well, when I was dealing with the post 9-11 sort of period of the book, what I found was the dehumanization that was taking place with regards to immigrants um, led us to this point of not being able to see the this sort of racialized person as a victim and seeing them as a threat. And part of this ability to not see them as a victim um, was part and parcel of this sort of ongoing dehumanization that plays into this idea of then deservedness, right? This who can be seen as a victim. And I talk about that a bit more about the different people who experienced uh, racially motivated crimes that were never treated as victims by the American public because we couldn't see Muslims as victims. Muslim, Muslims must always be the perpetrators. And there's a lot of Evelyn Sultani and others have done this research on the, um, the strength of the public um, popular culture narrative of constantly casting Middle Easterners and Muslims as sort of villains within our sort of popular culture stories. Um, so there is this idea of there was a point where there was an inconceivable vision of a Muslim being a victim. Um, and in fact, this idea post 9-11 that they deserve because, because a small group of people, and this is part of this um, white supremacist logic of punishment and in car carceral logic that pervades the US is this idea that because one um, person of a particular minority committed something, these disproportionate responses or these over-policing tendencies towards an entire minority are, are um, sort of um, necessary. Mm -hmm. Whereas when a white person commits anything um, to the point of mass shootings, we don't have the same generalizing, totalizing conversations about an entire race. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, at one point, like the, in the book, I talk about this like comedian who's like, I really want to record a recording every time something happens, just like click a button and go, look, I do, I denounce like, every single time the Muslims in the US live with this fear of, oh my God, please, please don't let it be a Muslim. Please don't let it be a Muslim. Whereas like you said, like there's no moment in which a shooter happens to be white and the entire white sort of demographic needs to apologize publicly denounce because there's an assumption that these categories of people are um more prone to criminality more prone to racism more prone x x y that whatever logic right 
So this idea of deservedness is wrapped into the idea of how much suspicion do we regard each racial minority with mm. and and how extreme must their suffering be for them to for us to be able to see them as victims like if they're inconvenienced a little bit can't you know if it's to the point where i'm seeing something like elon kirby for example then maybe i'm able finally to see them as victims imagine needing to go to that extreme so there there is there's a logic that the sort of um, limiting of, of sort of being able to see each other as humans, mm -hmm. being able to humanize each other that limits the idea of victimhood and it's wrapped into media narratives about people mm -hmm. over time. So if you spend so much time telling people that, for example, Pakistanis are X, Y, Z, what happens when they are victims and they need our hospitality mm -hmm. and there isn't the same vision of, you know, Whereas, for example, when you saw with Ukraine conversations, there was this immediate ability to see the humanity of a Ukrainian person needing refuge and this immediate opening up. And none of the conversations we had about Syrian refugees, we ended up having about Ukrainian refugees. Um, so, yeah, that that element of victimhood is wrapped into the humanization or dehumanization sort of spectrum within each society. So, yeah, it's a very... Great yes, question. we have time for one more question. Yes, you're good. <laughs> so um, imperfect response because it's colored by my own perspective and I talk a little bit to other academics and I go, you could apply it to a different field. But some main elements are there needs to be a pathway to settlement. They need, there needs to be a pathway to not being depend, being dependent on others in order to achieve um, your own sort of um, uh, sort of goals in life. Um, there is an element of so that's a a naturalization pathway, for example, that is part of it. Um, there is an element within media where I talk about. Um, hospitality being a need to see other people as human and to avoid dehumanization tropes that I identify from one period to the next. Um, but also, finally, it's this element of openness. So beyond all these different manifestations, um, is there an openness to the other when they come, a willingness to learn from them, a willingness to meet them where they are? And this is actually something I take from uh, Kwa Kanen, who is a um, uh, who is an indigenous scholar who talks about this importance of openness, um, especially when dealing with um, immigrant and racialized minorities in the classroom. So this actually comes from education. And there's a bit, there's a lot of theory in the book that actually comes from education. Um, I use norm critique, which is a theory that comes out of sort of queer theories of education. Um, so how do you design a world based on the per perspective of the person who was excluded from it. So how do you design your immigration policy? And that's a very important thing. Like oftentimes you find that the immigration policy is drawn up by people who do not include at any point someone who is an immigrant from that category in legislating the lives. So you're, you're, you come in as a Syrian immigrant, your life is ruled by things you have no control over. If you're not a citizen. So Norm Critisk actually tries to adopt the perspective of the person who has been excluded in the design of something and think, how can I re redesign that university, educational institution, social gathering, et cetera, from that perspective? Um, it's important, like it, you can think of it in terms of being, for example, immunocompromised during COVID. You can think of it being uh, racial minority or linguistic minority in a classroom, you can think of it in terms of immigration policy. And what I try to do is me, myself being an immigrant, my family at the time being um, asylum applicants in the US, thinking of how could I redesign the system that I'm now navigating from the perspective of the person who's being legislated by it, but excluded from designing the policies that, that navigate, that, that govern their lives. I think that is both an elegant and an empathic note uh, on which to end. So please 
Join me again in thanking Dr. Noor Khalidi for speaking with us today. Thank you. Thank you.